Hey, hey. Yeah, we're here now. It's eight fifteen. Hey. Hey, hey. Sorry for the delay. I had the the previous communications call uh, running late, and we we finally had some time to talk. You know, beyond tasks, and you know, just you know, brainstorm and ideate how to expand what what we're having here, including uh, how to properly position the task treatment as a unique phenomenon that is beyond just Kaggle and you know a successful example of how people can just jump in with a shared idea and kick off the the collaboration pretty cool we are kind right. of going like off into nowhere with our ideas <laughs> all right i let me think. See. Is Sid gonna join us? I, guess I think so. Oh, there he is. I think him. Yeah, he just he's in. All right. So, Hillary, do you want to kick off? I'll I'll kind of let you uh, drive more of these calls, and uh, because you you seem to to be hands-on with, you know, even Trello and other things. Uh, Alessia is, is doing a great job of creating a structure for you guys to follow. But yeah, I'll let you kick off. Yeah, we need her, to, like, we're kind of like, we need her to keep us organized <laughs> and focused a little bit. Um, okay, so right now we've kind of started splitting into two different directions. So, or I guess three different directions now. So originally we were trying to make a survey for non-hospitalized patients that we could go through. Um, I did follow up with two of the physicians in Slack. Uh, so Randall and Egahan, we're hoping to have a call with both of them at some point this week. Um, we've also looked like we're doing a survey for physicians about meds that are being prescribed to the patients, um, which I wasn't involved in. Arthur, do you wanna fill us in on that? The survey for patients? No, survey for physicians. Oh, survey for physicians. I think the last time we talked yesterday was um, you potentially talking to Randall and figuring out a way to structure that, that survey based on his expertise as physician. Okay, all right. Then I understand. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to connect with those guys and try to get that information. Um, talking from Megahad earlier, it sounds like it's going to be really challenging legally to get any kind of anonymized aggregated data set from like, like the patient physician notes, which is really what a lot of the uh, subject matter experts on Slack are requesting. Um, so I think we kind of just have to stick with what we have in the public literature for now and potentially like we could make a tool that they could use on their data sets, but I don't think they're gonna give us access. Um, and then the, the other kind of direction we've started swinging into, and I was talking with Siddhartha and somebody else in the Slack earlier, um, is identifying various pharmaceuticals that are either going to be a higher risk for the patients coming in. So there should be like a red flag, like this patient is on this drug and we need to keep an eye on them because they might crash, might be at higher risk of crashing. Um, and also pharmaceuticals that might be prophylactic. Um, and so we're kind of digging into that a little bit. I think our biggest challenge right now is we're kind of waiting. It seems like there's two or three groups that are working on categorizing the, the literature, like so all of the papers that we have um, in order that we can then go in and pull the relevant data. Yeah, and, so, and I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. Uh, yeah. I keep seeing the same conversations happening here and there. And you know, there are different uh, kind of uh, domains in which they're happening. I think um, it's okay that we're creating this kind of redundant effort at this stage, just because each of the teams is focused on, you know, their own uh, goal. And, you know, the, the sooner we converge is better, but it's okay for us to explore these tasks on our own and then converge into the, the common uh, structure. So I think um, what we can take from Dan Sosa is actually a template uh, that he shared not sure if you've seen it, for um, humans to annotate uh, the papers. 
I haven't had a chance to see that. Have you seen that? I didn't, but I, I probably wouldn't understand it. <laughs> no, no, it's just a spreadsheet for, uh, um, for people to take the papers and annotate them. Okay. So if you I'm give me one say, minute, I can try to find it in the screen share. Thank you. That would be great. You want to do that? I'm actually super happy you're joining us. Uh, yeah, let me just try to find it. Hold on. Oh, sorry, Mindy. I get kind of like energetic and I bounce around. Yeah, it's better when uh, you're closer to the microphone because you are just talking very low. Yeah, yeah, I tend to like, and I'm physically moving. Oh, now it's good. But yeah, uh, meanwhile, uh, Dan is looking for the spreadsheet. Basically, it's, it's a basic spreadsheet that people like, actually, uh, maybe uh, Mindy could help us um, with, with this and basically try to do her, her best at um, annotating the papers specific to our use case. And, oh, go ahead. Then. Um, is there someone I can team up with directly to sort of communicate, um, just see like what the progress is and whatnot and updates? Yep. So to answer that, I wish there was some like, you know, existing structure, but unfortunately we're, we're figuring things on the fly and, you know, creating something uh, for the structure that haven't existed before is, is very challenging. So the best uh, next step is just checking out the Trello board uh, for the tasks that are out there, probably uh, connecting with us on a daily call and uh, understanding like the specific, uh, you know, follow up uh, actions that we're taking here. So for the task treatments, just a high level, we have some uh, angles exploring the survey data as a potential way to, you know, funnel in some learnings and the trying to extract the data from the initial core 19 data set. Mm. Okay. So for us to extract that data, we are trying to filter papers to just the ones that are case studies and case reports that may have uh, actual quantitative data in them. And that's where Dan comes in. You wanna... Yeah, so um, if you can all see my screen, this is, the, this is a screenshot of the notebook that we sent to the annotators. So each row is one paper in the core 19 data set. We're hoping to have a thousand papers annotated because the task is, is fairly quick, I would think. So you go to the paper. So let's say we're looking at row three. We're gonna look at this biological effects of HPV paper. Uh, the annotators can click the link and then we just want them to analyze what kind of study is it? Is it an in silico, in vitro, in vivo, or if it's a clinical study based on kind of the, the levels of evidence, uh, we hope the annotators will also annotate which study design is used in this clinical study. And a paper can have multiple labels. For example, if it's a nature paper where it's some in silico work followed up by some in vitro and in vivo uh, experiments, then all of those things would be checked off. But essentially each cell in this row is just like a little checkbox where the annotators label the kind of paper it is. Okay, got it. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, where can I find this? It's on the Trello board or some other channel or? Um, if you need this, I can make a copy of it for you. And Please do. If, yeah, could yeah. you like maybe send a link here um, if you have it right now? Open up. Yeah, can uh, you send it yeah, I can just start. I can just start tonight. Let me send you a copy. So, are you are you trying to annotate the same data because we already have the team who's working on this? Okay, so what am I working on? <laughs> Okay, so uh, what the end output is annotating uh, papers with uh, the ones, uh, the, the data about the ones that have uh, clinical results, right, uh, Hillary? So basically the ones that are case reports or case studies, correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, you're right. So um, once Dan's group does this like nice categorization thing, we can go in and just snatch the info out of the clinical studies papers. So then, uh, do you think uh, we can uh, combine Hillary's effort with the other uh, uh, team members, or is it does it sound like a different task to you? 
<clears throat> no, so, this could be if, if the 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 categories you want are in this this uh, annotation spreadsheet, then that's perfect. But how can um, we easily tell if they are? Uh, can you read the columns here? Yeah, yeah. No, they are. So, I mean, I think I tried to two days ago or three days ago. I tried to connect everybody because it sounded like the work I was asking um, was it Michael to do was like mm -hmm. almost exactly the same as what your group was doing with the machine learning, which was really similar to what Maya's group was doing. Yeah. So then we all created a Slack channel where we all synced up about what we're doing and each team is almost taking a different approach to it, which is cool because there's, there's redundancy, but nobody's doing the same work. It seems like. Mm -hmm. So Maya's team is doing it with a simple, like, okay, if I search for the word in vitro or the words in vitro, will I find uh, that this is an experimental study? And she, she's just doing like keyword searches essentially, mm -hmm. which is like a great complicated first Complicated keyword mm -hmm. search. Which yeah, is, complicated. <laughs> yeah, but that's going to be a semantic, great. Semantic, yeah, one, which is amazing. Like I'm fascinated by their progress. Yeah, that's like a perfect first pass. And maybe that's like the best model in the end in terms of like simplicity and all that. Um, it looks like Daniel's group is considering some kind of clustering, like unsupervised learning based approach. I don't mm -hmm. know many of the details about that. You'd, you'd have to follow up with them. And then Christine and I are focusing on a supervised machine learning approach. So we get this data from the annotators and we use that to train a machine learning model so we can automatically classify papers without nice. having to use uh, like a vocabulary kind of thing. So this, as far as timelines go though, the work that you're doing with Maya already, that's going to be like the best place to get started. These annotations, I think I would expect them to come back within like a week and then it'll take maybe another two to three days for the machine learning guys to take over and actually like train their algorithms with this model, validate and all these things with, the, with this data and validate and all these things. Yeah, so the problem timeline. with the, the Maya's approach is it will work very nicely for things like smoking or heart disease or other things. I'm not sure it will work nicely for the clustering for kinds of like uh, presence of reports in terms of like case studies or case reports and other things because those are not really keywords. Right, it's a little bit tough. Like maybe you could search for like randomized control trial, but maybe they're referring to other studies that are randomized control trials and there can be all these weird confounders. So it's tricky, yeah. But basically I would not expect results from this supervised learning with the team of annotators for at least another week. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I think it's possible for us to create a, a smaller version of this, just uh, um, limited to the, the specific use case that uh, you, Hillary, is looking at. And I mm -hmm. think it's possible to take 100 papers and uh, create um, those annotations. And then we can take those to Michael and at least see what the results are and assess the quality. Because I bet they will be much better than just the, the keyword search. I'm That's nodding my head. <laughs> I agree. I don't, I don't, it sounds like there's a, same goal, but there's all these different ways to do it. And I'm not really familiar with the computer side of it. <laughs> yeah. And the best one is just to, to try the one that you feel the most comfortable with and you have time to, to do it. And that's what we've been doing across different things for, uh, f you know, for this time being. And it works. You just got to try. Also, just starting as simply as possible, then baking in more complexity as we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Uh, can you please uh, create a copy and send the link to Slack? Um, I'll try to connect with Hillary and simplify this sheet for just the case studies and case reports stuff. Sure, send it to the task treatment Slack? Yep. Okay, Thank sounds you. good. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, Hillary, do you wanna proceed? Yeah. Um... Does it make sense to you in, in general? I get that there's a lot of, you know, terms thrown around and we're talking about very, uh, you know, complex technical stuff. Um, again, I, I'm trying to jump in, in here and kind of give you that leap of faith that, um, you know, whatever we're thinking of makes sense. Uh, it may not make sense actually. And we've seen that, uh, you know, hypothesis being um, thrown away but um, you know there is an 
a high chance, high probability that we will stumble upon something that will help us formulate the next hypothesis that is better than the previous one. Yeah, I mean, from my limited understanding, I think it's it's interesting that there's all these different approaches being taken, and I, you know, I don't know what's going to turn out to be the best thing, but um, that's like the foundation on which all of the ideas John and I are tossing out are going to be like built up on. So, cool. Um, are there any kind of the the side ideas that you are having with uh, Sid? Uh, that I may have missed out and other people uh, skipped today. Um, uh, go ahead. No, 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 please go ahead. I was going to say, so, you know, Sid was tossing out all these really good points about ACE2 receptors. Um, so that's the viral target that we're looking at. And so he was pointing out, well, in smokers, you'd expect it to be upregulated. And John and I were actually having a private conversation about, one, whether we have any evidence that shows that upregulation of these receptors on cells actually increase your risk. I'm voting that it does. He's voting, you don't have data for that. <laughs> He's right. And, um, and then, you know, going back through some of the China data is we're finding out that um, in a lot of these studies, smokers are actually not being reported. And then in other studies, they're showing that when smokers are appearing, they're only appearing in this severe group. And so it's, you know, it's kind of interesting to me, like, why aren't we seeing more smokers every, everywhere, you know, why aren't they showing up in the mild group? Um, and then, so, and Imad, I might have mispronounced that, um, was mentioning that he had a list of different therapies and ideas um, for why it, you know, might be helping or might be hurting. And so, so, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, I think yeah, you made a good summary. Uh, in fact, like, uh, you know, uh, one thing I'd like to mention is, this, uh, whether it's, uh, whether smokers have, you know, higher amount of uh, ACE receptors also has an implication on uh, whether, you know, how effective ACE receptor blockers are, because if they are the ones who are, if, if, if it, if it, if they do have high receptors, number of receptors, but they do not progress to severe stage disease, then, uh, you know, uh, would ACE receptor blockers be, you know, really useful for anyone? Like, does it, does it count? And, and another thing is, which is confusing a bit to me is is like there uh, now that I find that ACE receptor blocker uh, ACE receptors are everywhere so they are in the kidney and in the lady cells of the testes and and in other places and so and the virus after a while does enter the circulation and you know attacks these places so um, are there conditions in which this receptor can be upregulated and does it would it cause more damage to those places uh, I mean uh, or or has such a thing. I don't know uh, if if it um, uh, has been or, or, or such a thing can be determined. And finally, I'd like to say, like in general, like I was thinking that uh, what we could uh, need to uh, do, do is like through literature search, or maybe if we can get you know some kind of anonymized data or survey or something, is determine like what set of you know treatments can be given at any stage based on like the current condition of the patient, which is like, first of all, like basic things like heart rate and uh, um, uh, uh, blood pressure and uh, PO2 and, and, and then more like if there are any metabolic anodes or um, other blood work uh, and, uh, uh, you know, depending on the severity of the disease. So if, it, if it's a person in the mild stage, which is certain uh, kind of background, would you give that person uh, ARB blocker and remdesivir or something and, and along with uh, the other uh, anti-inflammatory. I mean, this is a really complicated question, but uh, I'm wondering, like, if there is a protocol which doctors are following, and I don't, I'm not sure if there is, because I think people are trying different things, and uh, if we can come up with a tool that can, um, you know, uh, give suggestions, that uh, give the literature-based evidence at least, that, uh, 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 that that would help in this. So, so that was my thought. Yeah, and I think you make a really good point. I think that um, having these protocols for these physicians is really important. I was talking to Dan and Stefano, uh, I think yesterday, and one of the things we were pulling is getting all of these drugs out of the literature. Like, what are people testing in patients? How much are they testing? Um, what are the contraindications of those? And I think adding on what you just mentioned, like any data that we have that would, that would be relevant would be really helpful to that, um, that pursuit. So I, maybe I can link you in with them and we can, 
we can discuss that further. Um, John just pointed out to me that there's a Department of Defense COVID-19 practice management guide. So there's definitely um, guidances out there for hospitals about management of, of severe symptoms and critical illness and things. But I don't know if there's any kind of cohesive like world effort or if this is just our US specific. Um, but we can certainly like pursue that and dig into that more because I agree with you. I think a lot of the frontline physicians don't have this info in the literature and they're just kind of scrambling with whatever they heard. That would be really great. Like, uh, if, yeah, if you can uh, send a link to that guideline and, and we can see maybe like where does that guideline come from? Like what did the base, you know, that uh, any, any guideline from? So that, that, would, that would be interesting. Yeah, uh, I, I heard also something else to say, but I can add that later, but this is regarding that survey. Uh, yeah, just say it. Okay, so, uh, you know, I, I, when I was at Rockefeller University, like around five years ago, so I created a survey, it was, it took me quite a bit of a while, it's just Django, but uh, I had it in uh, AWS. And uh, what it does is, uh, the input is, uh, so this was for people with smelling disorders, you know, smelling disorders are uh, sometimes early sign for, um, uh, uh, like uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and, and, and uh, other, other kind of things. So uh, there's this interest uh, to identify like if people have different kinds of smelling, smelling disorders, which is like, uh, uh, it, it could be like you smell something for something else, it's called parosmia, you might know, or anosmia, you lose your sense of smell, or hyperosmia, hyperosmia, like smell too strong or too bad, like there are many dysfunctions. So, but uh, essentially to come to the point is like uh, what this survey was, it was collecting in a non-HIPAA data, in a completely anonymized, like it would generate a URL and a link, and it could be site and study specific because this, it's actually, it, it, it got used and, and people liked it. And uh, um, so uh, the input is just one thing. That's what I'm saying that it can be readily customized here. It's just an Excel file or, or I mean CSV file, which uh, has like uh, questions and you can group questions into sections and the question has a question number and you can put a question number as a parent a number and a parent child relationship uh, like if it is a parent to another question you can have that as a parent to the second question and and what that would help is like uh, it would allow for a tree navigation which a lot of you know standard uh, survey monkey or something it, it's hard to do that uh, kind of rule based navigation so so uh, uh, i mean rather uh, it's a tree navigation so if you go down a certain tree like have you smoked or did you uh, have this effect and then if, if the answer is yes then you go down a certain path in the tree and if, if not then you go down a certain path so now i have this thing and i can actually readily deploy it in a aws or some other instance and then i was wondering if if we could use a survey like that um i don't know yes i think that sounds amazing like i think that's exactly what we need to do with this because certain some of the questions are actually going to rule out the future answers, if that makes sense. And then other ones, we're gonna have that tree, like you said. So I think that's, that sounds like a great system. That's exactly what we're looking for. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll share the GitHub and I'll also uh, deploy it in a AWS instance. I mean, this doesn't have any data and uh, it's anyway like completely anonymized and no HIPAA stuff there. So yeah, we can uh, then maybe uh, talk, uh, you know, see if it can be used as a, like send that a survey link to people who uh, uh, have, uh, recovered or, or uh, yeah, maybe so it's surveyed like different kinds of surveys, maybe to physicians and, and something to this. That's amazing. And yeah, I mean, it sounds crazy, but like, that's exactly what we need right now. So, I mean, I think what would be important is giving you the list of questions and rules, right? The hierarchies. What I will do is that, I, yeah, I mean, that would help. I, I just send out like, there's a, there's a sample survey you'll see, uh, like for, uh, for patients, I mean, it, it was like, I think it had a thousand questions because this was a really long, you know, like, it, 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 I mean, uh, this, it, it was a very detailed survey, but, but you see the survey structure and what is needed and, and what we can do is that uh, definitely if you can send out like the questions, but if you can like create like five questions, you know, like with a, just, the, the, just like a starter and then all you do is upload that file and then like you're ready, like the whole system is fine. You can uh, start taking questions and actually in the end it can generate reports and graphs and stuff. I mean, basically that. Uh, but uh, let, let me send that, uh, uh, I'll share that GitHub link with you, I think which has a basic questionnaire and, um, and then uh, see like if you can do it. Um, 
you know, use it and, and then how to put the questions. And maybe you can also create a list of, uh, if somebody can create a list of like a basic questions, like very two or three, you know, like uh, which has a kind of a, like if you can put it into sections too, like one section could be uh, like the way I had as demographics, the other was comorbidities, the other had uh, things like that. And, and within each section, like you can have a parent-child kind of navigation, you know, like um, say, are, are you, uh, Hispanic, and if you are Hispanic, then which kind of Hispanic? Then it would ask like that. You know? So uh, yes, I mean that would be perfect because I we kind of generated a, a list of questions, but I do want to touch base with the physicians to make sure there aren't more questions that we should be asking. And then we also have two um, like survey question writers because that's like a unique skill set. Um, so we can it's Maria and I think Arda um, who are going to write the questions for us so that they're they're well written. So, I mean, that would be awesome. And I'm sorry, I heard somebody starting to talk. So we'll go ahead, whoever that was. Not me anyway, thanks. Uh, I had, that's all I had to say, but uh, I will follow up. Sounds good. So yeah, let's, let's kick off that process with the survey. Um, I assume that we can use that initial structure that you, Hillary, uh, uploaded to Trello card. Um, maybe let's extend it with uh, the answers, the potential answers. I know that we expected Cameron to, to help with that. Not sure if you had a chance to work with him on that, but maybe the, uh, newcomers could help. Mindy, if uh, you mentioned that you have a uh, degree in linguistics, right? Genetics. <laughs> oh, genetics. Oh, I'm sorry. So many people are joining, but yeah, maybe yeah. If you feel comfortable helping Hillary um, yeah, it's fine. With the survey, that would be great. Again, we're we're kind of we're having this environment where people are not necessarily doing exactly the things that they're yeah. best at, but there's also power to to that, and there is this suddenly there is uh, you know fun to it too because mm -hmm. it it really uh, puts you in, into this active learning environment, and just being mm -hmm. a critical thinker becomes a very powerful thing. And, you know, everyone is shy to contribute because they think that there is someone who can contribute better and has more experience. But in reality, when everyone is like that, no one moves a thing. But hopefully, and this has been the experience so far, everyone feels that, you know, it's not about the imposter syndrome and, you know, just like you, you have to start doing something and showcase mm -hmm. your work. And then all of a sudden it becomes... Uh, you know, the main driver of the progress. Mm -hmm. I, I keep telling people the, the main thing that I'm doing, I'm just like letting spark here, there, and then all of a sudden, two, three days after there is a flyer. Mm -hmm. That is great. Uh, by the way, I send uh, two links in chat and the second, the first one is the overall thing. This is like a five-year-old project I have to, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I mean, I wrote it so I know. Uh, how it works, but uh, the second link is actually the questionnaire, and I think it's public. So if you can click and see, then you will see like what I'm talking about. Uh, if it works for you, otherwise I'll, I'll just uh, you know set to, so that it is public. Uh, I think this one is public. Awesome, thank you, yeah. Mindy. So you said you're a geneticist. I think we might have a a project that's interesting for you. Do you want to take a look at? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at this point, I'm open to anything. I mean, just to give you an update. So I studied genetics in college and then worked in biotech and then I did analysis through Excel and then I went to a boot camp, data science boot camp. So I know like SQL, Python, machine learning. And then I just basically wanted to help out here. So that's a little bit about my background. So I'm open to anything. But yeah, I do know genetics. So I pretty much followed Sid's presentation pretty well. So I can help out anywhere. Uh, we were just thinking at one point it might be possible to uh, reach out to and talk to companies like 23andMe mm -hmm. or to people who are customers and have control over their own information. You're able to download uh, anything that they've produced and some, of the, some people will take that and upload it to public databases for uh, searching and things right. like that. We were wondering yeah, if I did that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, see? So, we might be able to use that information to get at some genetic susceptibility. Okay. Uh, we have confirmed where suspected patients submitting code, and then we get somebody to look at that. Uh, hi, actually, uh, I just sent, uh, I think I posted a link in maybe the data uh, uh, channel that 
there is this uh, consortium which does precisely this. It's called COVID-19 AG. Uh, dot org. I think I, I'll paste the link. And, and what they have is they have collected the, this very specific data that we want, the genetic thing, and they have done some analysis. Now, of course, the data set is not uh, available online, but uh, I was wondering if they can be contacted because, uh, I, I, and in a mention about like, uh, you know, we are also trying to link this data set with uh, literature and other things uh, and, and run, run uh, analysis on it. So if they are willing to share at least uh, some version of this. Um, I'm again posting this link in the chat so you will see. Uh, then um, I don't know if, if, if that it can be contacted. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that would definitely be worth, I think, following up with. Because um, genetic susceptibility, you know, it impacts everything. It impacts, it could impact viral progression. It could impact how everything interacts with the pharmaceuticals, uh, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. All right. Does anybody, uh, does anybody have any like off the wall ideas they just want to throw out that they're thinking about? Or? I think we're good. Uh, I think the core pieces to focus on are, uh, let me just summarize the, the core follow up uh, actions. We uh, need to create a copy of Dan Sosa's uh, spreadsheet for annotation. Uh, basically simplify it for the sake of the case reports and case studies uh, annotations. Um, maybe you, Hillary, John, and Mindy could sync on how to get us to 100 of, of those mm -hmm. um, annotations and then basically pushing that to Michael and uh, testing if, if that's enough data, if the results are uh, better than the, the previous search. And yeah, that's one of the core pieces. The second piece is um, checking out what Sid has in terms of surveys and preparing um, the list of questions and the rules for those. Um, might be a little tedious task, but um, yeah, still, you know, has, someone has to do it. So, and the third piece is just exploring the genetics angle, checking out the link that Sid sent over and thinking through ideas for that. Does that sound right? Did I miss anything? I think you got it. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right, sounds good. I'll be posting Trello cards as a follow up for, for this call and I upload, I'll, I'll upload the call for, for people that missed it. All right, thank you. Okay, Thanks All right. everybody. Thanks guys, bye. All right, bye.